Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 17th, 2016. Yesterday was the 10th anniversary of the first Econ Talk episode. I've been going for 10 years now in calendar time. I want to thank all the listeners who have been with us, uh, particularly those from the beginning, those who have gone back to the beginning and uh, been patient with my interviewing skills as they have uh, grown, I hope, over the years. Uh, This will be episode number 523. And my guest today is Richard Jones. He is Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation and Professor of Physics at the University of Sheffield. He has written extensively on both the technical aspects of nanotechnology and its social and ethical implications. Uh, His work as an experimental physicist concentrates on the properties of biological and synthetic macromolecules at interfaces. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2006 and was awarded the Institute of Physics Tabor Medal for Nanoscience in 2009. His blog is Soft Machines, and he is the author of Soft Machines, Nanotechnology, and Life. And he recently released an ebook, which is our topic for discussion today. The title is Against Transhumanism. That book is available online without charge. We will link to it. Richard, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks. Yes, pleasure. What is transhumanism? Well, transhumanism—it's—it's—it's it's, it's a—it's a bunch of ideas, really. That, uh, that, that there are more than one definition of it, but it's a bunch of ideas that really concern the idea that technology—that—that—that that, that technology is accelerating so fast that it's going to change not only our way of life, but what it means to be a human. So, transhumanists are associated with ideas about technology leading to advanced artificial intelligence, about it leading to. Uh, you know, great advances in medical technology that will eventually you know, mean the end of aging and death, essentially. And uh, technologies like nanotechnology conceived of in a very radical form that will essentially eliminate uh, any kind of material scarcity. So it's a kind of belief package that comes together to think that technology is advancing so fast that it's going to solve these uh, problems that, uh, that, that humanity has been worrying about for some time. It's going to kind of create a new era in history history people transhumanists talk about a singularity which separates you know the the knowable world that we live in now with some uh, transcendent world in the future where everything has changed as a result of uh, the, the, these accelerating technologies it's interesting week to be talking about this and these are issues that have come up on econ talk uh, a number of times in, in a bunch of episodes but uh we're at a, this week um alpha go which is a uh, computer program to play the game of Go, beat the world champion Lee Sedol uh, four matches to one. It's also a week that Moore's Law, some people are saying, is coming to an end, which would be a, um, or at least slowing down, which would be a bleak forecast for the uh, optimism of the transhumanist folk. Um, Before we get into the details of whether the transhumanist vision is realistic or not, and whether it's a good thing, Uh, You tie the belief in the singularity and transhumanism to religious apocalyptic beliefs that go back to the Middle Ages. Uh, That's interesting. Why does it matter and what's the connection? Well, it, 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 it is interesting. Um, the, the connection is actually pretty obvious when you uh, when you read what transhumanists write, and in fact, you know, in some cases, it's made pretty explicit. I mean, certainly in Ray Kurzweil's work, it, it is absolutely explicit. You, you know, one of his most famous books is called "The Age of Spiritual Machines," so it, it, it's, it's not surprising. So I think um, you know it taps into a long held tradition in, in, in Western thought about this uh, about this future that's coming along that that, uh, that, that uh, in which you know we have a kind of all wise uh, uh, intelligence looking after us that all material uh, all our material scarcity issues are solved and you know all our kind of bodily pains and griefs have gone away so 
you know that's the kind of um, that, that that that's the uh, that, that that's the background. Uh, people talk about uh, the singularity as the rapture of the nerds in Ken McLeod's marvellous phrase. Okay. It's a marvellous phrase because it's both very insulting but actually contains a real kernel of truth. And, you know, if you trace back the history of the thought, uh, of thought and I trace it back in the e-book in two directions, but one in one direction through weirdly a bunch of british marxist scientists in the uh, in in the 20s and 30s uh, most and notably desmond bernal who kind of came from a catholic background and sort of combined his catholic upbringing with his marxist convictions uh, to, uh, to 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 plot out this this, this future transformed world that of course plays into uh, i mean i think what is widely thought of when in certain interpretations of Marxism that Marxism itself was a kind of secularization of those religious traditions of apocalypse uh, and there's also this very interesting connection through the Russian cosmists who uh, um, you know emerged out of some slightly odd uh, Russian Orthodox thinkers in the 19th century but actually informed the kind of futuristic thinking that underpinned you know uh, the the uh, um, you know, early pioneers of uh, of rockets and uh, the, the the Soviet space program. So culturally, it, it's fascinating. Does it matter? Um, it does matter. I think you know, understanding the history of ideas is important. Uh, some ideas, um, you know, just because the, the, these ideas have roots in you know a particular variety of. Uh, Christian thinking, even a particular variety of Marxism thinking, doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong, but one needs to understand that uh, these are not new ideas, people have thought them before, and uh, it's not obvious that uh, they're, they're going to be any more right this time around than they were in the past. Well, you know, Marxists often say that Marx was so for, for, far-sighted that his predictions haven't come true yet, uh, so that that could apply here, or maybe not, as you can see in the book, it doesn't mean that these predictions may not be true and i would just add you know as a being a religious jew myself i I have a lot of respect for religion but i found that when you tell non-traditionally religious people that is people who consider themselves atheists that they have a religious component to their worldview they don't take it very well um they get extremely (laughs) insulted uh and don't like it so i suspect that claim of yours or point of yours that parallel that you pointed out uh, I assume people have reacted badly to that. Um, I, it, it varies in the past they, that they have, and you know, I should say I'm a vicar's son too, so I, 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 you know, it's a heritage that I'm familiar with and respectful of. Uh, so, but I think you know, the key point is that the things that drive some of that thinking, you know, people, it, there is an element of wishful thinking, I think, particularly in some of the, the uh, some of the kind of apoc- apocalyptic strains of thought that have uh, run through, well, you know, it's not just Western religion, but, you know, Western religion in particular for a long time. And I think if one doesn't recognize that strain of wishful thinking, one can be misled. Yeah, well, I think it's healthy um, to keep that in mind all the time. So let's get to the tech, more technical side. You say that the idea of transhumanism is associated with three technological advances that uh, are, perha- are perhaps accelerating. Uh, they are radical nanotechnology, radical extension of human lifetimes, and the inevitability of radically improved artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, how do these work together? And uh, then we'll talk about why you're skeptical about actually each of them. Well, uh, nanotechnology, I mean, radical nanotechnology, the idea of radical nanotechnology, I think the best way of thinking about it, it's, it, it's the proposition that, that one can digitalize the material world in the same way, you know, we're used to the idea that we've digitalized, digitized music, we've digitized vision in, in, in the sense of uh, films and such like. So it's the idea that we can reduce the material world to software, because if you can reduce the material world to software and you have some interface between the software and the external world, you know, an assembler that can make things, you know, essentially you can make anything and you can go beyond that because then you have kind of complete control over over the material world 
and in that way, uh, you know, having incidentally abolished all forms of scarcity, then one can go on to intervene in biology at the most fundamental level. So, uh, uh, and in that way, control all the shortcomings of biology, like dying, for example. Uh, and uh, you can also then create computers of the most immense power. Of course, it works the other way around. You need to have the um, uh, uh, you need the power of advanced computing, if you like, to do all the stuff that you need to do to control the material world in such a way. So these things are all mutually reinforce, and uh, you know, in the vision of transhumanists, it's that mutual reinforcement of control of the material world, control of the biological world, control of the digital world. That, uh, that that come together to to create this kind of transcendent event that people call the singularity. And to be, um, we're going to get into why you you think the the more radical visions uh, uh, that people are having about the potential of these technologies, while well, you're skeptical of them. But certainly, we see in today, 2016, steps toward that. We see uh, artificial. We see 3D printed stuff that is very quickly becoming quite complicated and interesting. Um, we see, as I mentioned earlier, a, a computer beating a human being in a, a game of Go that people thought might not be amenable to artificial intelligence. So many things that people said weren't going to happen, uh, things like various forms of, of facial recognition. Uh, things they're, they're making huge strides. So um, the trends all look promising, don't they? Well, they do look promising. And in a sense, you know, what's annoying about transhumanism to me is that, you know, it sort of co-opts the actual achievements of technology, but then it uses them as evidence for the for, for, for these what I think are actually fundamentally wish fulfillment fantasies. So, you know, it's the fact that uh, that medicine advances is fantastic and to be encouraged and you know one's really pleased about the progress that, that that's been made one's also kind of daunted to some extent by the scale of the challenge so uh, um you know in medicine there are many big challenges that remain un, 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 unfulfilled as yet in information technology yeah we've just lived through an extraordinary period of uh, in, in which the period in which Moore's law held that has been astonishing not totally unpre unprecedented but uh, a faster piece of technological development that we've seen before and you know that's been transformative but all of these things have happened because you know the circumstances behind a particular technology came together much effort was put to make them happen. I guess what I worry about with transhumanism is from looking at the existing technological uh, breakthroughs that we're seeing, not really appreciating what's, what it's taken to make those happen and then assuming that technology is an autonomous force that will just continue and deliver this uh, the, the, this um, the this marvellous future, that I think is the kind of pernicious worry about it. So it's a, kind of, it's a funny thing, transhumanism, because it kind of it rests on you know, correct observations about the power of technology to transform where we've got to now. But I think the conclusions it draws from that in terms of the direction of the direction and inevitability of future technology, I think are a bit pernicious. Well, let's start with um, – and we should actually mention, by the way, that, that Moore's Law, for those who don't know, is the uh, – I'm, I'm reading now that, that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit has doubled approximately every two years. That is that computing power per square centimeter seems to somehow – seemingly like a law, seemingly like a natural process, just improve continuously. And as you point out, that may not continue um, and there's – uh, it's there's certainly nothing inevitable about it, uh, akin to say gravity. But l let's let's move to nanotechnology per se. Now, can, can I just yeah. stay stay with Bohr's law a moment, sure. actually, because I think it's really interesting and really telling. Because you know it's talked about as a law. Uh, Kurt's file generalizes it to say you know there's a general exponential law of accelerating everything. Actually, uh, uh, 
But Moore's Law, it's a very interesting thing because it isn't a law. It's actually a social construct. It's actually, you know, it actually was quite an interesting social innovation that made the Moore's Law happen. Moore's Law, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that it's a way of organising the actions of many innovation actors, you know, you know, through software and hardware. It's a way of getting lots of people to work together to a kind of common external tide table to, 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 to make, to, to kind of fulfill the prophecy. So in order to, um, to, to get those, those gains in computer power, those, re those reductions in size of transistors, you know, many different companies, specialty chemicals companies, equipment manufacturers, the actual uh, uh, people who are bringing it all together, semiconductor companies like Intel, they all had to work in a coordinated way to this roadmap that's presented, that, 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 that actually underlies Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is not a law at all, it's a social construction, actually a very interesting and powerful social construction. And it, it is coming to an end, it's coming to an end partly because the physics is getting much more difficult but actually, as much as anything, it's because the economics is getting more difficult. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to so, add. Yeah. The, the, it's, it's an emergent phenomenon that we've given a name to, uh, which may give it some impetus of its own, but no one's trying to fulfill Moore's Law. People are trying in general to, quote, do better, make more money, express themselves, all kinds of complicated things. And the result has been something we've given a name to, this social construct called Moore's Law. There's... No reason to think it won't, uh, that it'll continue. Uh, but there is reason to believe that it could get better, that computing can get better, as long as incentives are there for that to happen. We could stop those incentives. They could stop on their own through reasons like physics and other things we don't control. So um, I think it's important to think about technology as an emergent process rather than a directed process, although there are, of course, parts of it that are directed. Well, you know, I think if you look at the, the you know, the International uh, Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, actually that was, uh, you know, it was, there was no central agency that created it, but it was a rather interesting social process that wrote down, you know, these are the new, this is the technologies that will have to be developed. These are the new materials that will have to be developed. These are the new, uh, the, these are the new equipment, pieces of equipment, the, the, the lithography equipment, all that sort of thing. It was actually a, quite a deliberate piece of coordinated action to get everything to come together to, to deliver more law. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with you that it was entirely emergent. And it wasn't a single, you know, there was no single corporation it that did it. Or there it was wasn't no top down is all, all I meant by it. It wasn't directed yeah. literally. Uh, there, were, there may have been some coordination. You know, there are many things that happen in the market that are, that look coordinated, that aren't coordinated, that are, you know, signals by prices and other things. This is a case, maybe a little, it's a little bit of a mix. Uh, but as you point out, uh, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it seems to be um, coming to an end. Uh, let's talk about just... Let's stick with nanotechnology for another minute or two. The um, it's a really beautiful idea that we could um, sort of maybe that we could reorganize molecules or matter itself to do whatever we wanted. It's sort of a, a radical reimagining of the constraints of reality. Um, is there any evidence that that that's going to be possible? And if and if if not, um, or if not right now. Uh, why do you think it won't happen in the future? Well, there's a very good piece of evidence that at some level it is possible, but I think that piece of evidence has been misinterpreted by many people who are, uh, you know, who are transhumanists. So the evidence that it is possible is that biology does it. So, you know, if you've got a cow in a field, a cow in a field is a machine for taking bits of grass and converting them into rump steak. And that's, you know, quite a significant transformation. It, it's taking the atoms and molecules of, uh, of grass and it's rearranging them in very sophisticated ways to, 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 to make some structure whose blueprint essentially is digitally laid down through the, through the genome of the animal. So plants, animals, all of us, this is actually what we're doing. We, there is an element to which you can think that biology does constitute the software control over matter in some restricted sense. So, uh, it's, undeniably, you know, it's undeniably true, right? A, a, a child right. grows up is that a child grows up 
uh, or that a calf becomes a cow. Forget the complicated part about the rump steak. Just growth in life, a tree, a tree coming from a seed is an absurd bit of magic. It's it's clearly a remarkable set of processes that lead that to happen. That's right. And so, you, you know, looking, go, going down to the cell biology, you look at, you know, the ribosome. The ribosome is the, 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 the molecular machine that reads the code of DNA, or it reads it from, from RNA, in fact, and it from the digital code on the RNA molecule that it reads, it converts that into a particular protein molecule. So that is genuinely an example of the software based construction of a atomically precise product the protein so that's you, you know that's a remarkable uh, it, it is as astonishing and uh, and amazing and it's beautiful science that we've been able to find out how that works and uh, what's going on in those processes so yeah so so cell biology is an existence proof at some level that some really rather special kind of radical nanotechnology is indeed possible. But you don't think it's going to happen? Well, there's the Beyond the, is, the biological, or at least there's some limit to what, how we are able to mimic those biological um, processes. The but is this. So um, in, in the, the, the view of radical nanotechnology, most associated with Eric Drexler, for example, the, the argument goes something like this. It's biology shows that you can do it but biology does it in a kind of haphazard and random way it uses you know the kinds of materials it uses are pretty shoddy i mean proteins are not things that you'd want to you know build anything big or strong out of uh so the argument is that biology shows that it's possible but biology does it with kind of poor materials. It's just constrained by, you know, the random way that evolution has taken place. Uh, you know, as soon as we put on a, uh, um, you know, as soon as we get somebody with a PhD from MIT on the job, they'll do much better. We'll use proper design principles, we'll use proper materials, and we'll get something that's much more powerful. And there's something that's much more powerful in the kind of uh, the, the visions that are associated with Eric Drexler are basically things that look like mechanical engineering, but uh, shrunk down to, to, to the nano scale. And so my argument is this, and I think it's a, a, an important one, and it's an argument that's only been possible to make in the last 20 years. Now we understand how biology works. Actually, cell biology works the way it does because that's the right kind of technology for the nanoscale because the physics that takes place at the nanoscale is different. It feels, it looks different to the, the physics that we're used to intuitively at the macro scale. Things that to us look slightly strange, the dependence on random motion, the dependence on things sticking together and unsticking, the thing the dependence on molecules flexing, opening up, shutting down. You know, these things, they're not, they do it that way because that's a very effective way to do it at our scale. So, you know, if you, the, the kind of great classic picture of radical nanotechnology is this idea of grey goo, this idea that, you know, if we make, we could make a replicator that would go around and reproduce itself by munching the you know the food from the environment and converting it itself into more copies of itself what we're describing there is essentially a bacteria that's what a bacteria does and i suppose the argument of the radical nanotechnologist is that bacteria you know we'd very rapidly be able to make a better bacteria than a bacteria is because you know we're clever and understand so yeah but i think that fundamentally misunderstands how optimized bacteria are for that nanoscale world and how much more difficult it's going to be to do that than uh, by uh, just by using you know, inappropriate concepts that we learn in macroscale engineering. I can't help but be reminded by the um, – what's called in economics the socialist calculation debate that a central planner could outperform markets because markets are just – haphazard and they come together through prices, but they're not designed to achieve anything. So if we were in charge and we had just, you know, the only challenge there, you just need a big enough computer, which of course in the 30s was not, was a pipe dream. Uh, now we have a big enough computer in some sense. So we have a much bigger computer calculating power than we had then, but we still are no closer to than, than we were then to being able to plan a, 
a 330 million or a 7 billion person economy uh, and and achieve what is achieved through market processes. So it's uh, it's a uh, there's there's a certain um, messianic uh, romanticism there again that that's drawing on other traditions. Uh, it seems to me in its appeal. I think you're exactly right. I, I think that the, your parallel there is, is exact. I, you know, there's a, a, a very close parallel behind the you know the kinds of emergent processes that happen in a cell where you know many things happen that are really determined by local interactions when it's the you know the emergent combination of all those local interactions that produces the uh, the, the, the the magic that is a metabolism you know so, the, what people talk about in systems biology you know these things that are not actually you know that there isn't a central controller that's making them all work it is this emergent process and i think you know the analogy to a planned and unplanned economy is is uh, is very apt so in, in your book, there's a lot of um, technical discussion, nanotechnology that we're not going to get into, but uh, I encourage readers who are more uh, technically versed to go take a look at that. But I, the part I found most interesting about the book was uh, uh, maybe not the most, but one of the most was the discussion of whether we'll ever be able to upload a brain into a computer. And the argument there is that I'm going to read um, – I'm going to read the way uh, you write about in the book. You say – Uploading a human consciousness to a computer remains both a central aspiration of transhumanists and a source of queasy fascination to the rest of us. The idea is that someone's mind is simply a computer program. Then the future could be run on a much more powerful computer than a brain, just as one might run an old arcade game on a modern PC in emulation mode. Mind uploading has a clear appeal for people who wish to escape the constraints of our flesh and blood existence – Notably, the constraint of our inevitable mortality. So, you know, I've thought a lot about the fact that just even in the last five years, the ability to keep photographs and mindless musings through blogs that we have it is quite extraordinary. Um, a, a record of our lives is already being accumulated into the digital cloud. But that is nothing like what this vision is. This vision is really that that my conscious mind would simply be acting uh, like it does now, but instead of in a, a wet environment, as you phrase it, it would just be in a dry environment of a, of a computer. Um, you suggest that is not going to happen. What are the challenges? Well, I think, it, yeah, I, I mean, there the, are the two questions. One is, you know, do I think it's possible in principle? Do you, do I think it's going to happen, you know, any time soon, soon, soon being the next 100 years? I'm pretty confident that it won't happen in the next 100 years. I mean, I think there is a very interesting, Darn. you know. Uh, yeah, sure. I and mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, there's an interesting point in principle. I think it, it rests, or, or the idea that it might happen rests on some misunderstandings of how the brain works, and in particular, how complicated the brain is. And I think the big point I'd make is, you know, the, one can look at um, extrapolations from Moore's law, indeed, about you know how, how how many transistors that you can get in a in, in a computer. And it's very tempting to say, well, okay, what's the unit of uh, of uh, computation in a brain? Uh, the usual suspect would be to look at you know, how many neurons you've got because we know that neurons are important in, 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 in computation in the brain. But I think uh, that, that that's a kind of mistake because it, uh, it, it assumes that the neuron is the basic unit of computing and it's not. And I think the most important point I think in I, that there is in that chapter is that the unit of computing in biology is not a neuron, it's a molecule. Uh, you know, the simplest life forms are doing a great deal of computing all the time. You know, a bacteria, you think a bacteria is simple and crude, but it is sensing its environment. It's doing calculations to, to incorporate the information it gets about its environment, and then it's responding to those calculations by changing its behavior or indeed changing its in, it, it, its, it, it, its essence. Uh, maybe not its essence, but its external form. So uh, when you understand that, then you realize that the scale of computation that's happening in your brain is just many, many, many orders of magnitude greater than the scale that we can conceive of in a synthetic system. So that's 
uh, I think that's the most important point. I think there's a secondary point about you know how you how one can simulate brains and you know the nature of simulation in complicated multi-level systems. You know, in a sense, a counter argument to that would be, well, I know that a computer, you know, what's going on on a computer is more. Uh, more complicated than just transistors because the transistors themselves integrate the behavior of lots of electrons uh, so you know and that's uh, I could make an argument that actually you know a true simulation of a computer would need to involve actually looking at what the electrons are doing not just what the transistors are doing which again gives you many many more orders of magnitude of, of complexity but the key difference there is that there is a difference between a designed system and an evolved system. And that distant difference is this. A, a design system like a computer has a kind of separation of levels. You can talk about a transistor as being an independent unit and you understand how it behaves without understanding what the electrons are doing because we've designed it that way. A, an evolved system there's no kind of separation of levels of complexity that you can rely on because the thing's evolved. No one's designed it so that, you know, to make it easier to, to design the circuits. It's just evolved from um, the simplest organisms that are still doing all this information processing up to uh, complicated higher animals that are doing much more complicated kinds of information processing. So I think it's that misunderstanding that has given people false hope that we'd be able to reproduce a... a, a a consciousness on the kind of time scales that are foreseeable given what we know so about how is that there's two parts to that one to me one one is this you say it's many many orders of magnitude and of course the answer to that is just okay so it'll take longer um so the really the question is whether there's some fundamental barrier and it seems to me that you're closer to the that issue when you talk about the evolve versus design so I can reverse – I can't, but someone can reverse engineer a, a device, a gadget, a designed product. So you know, you can look at it. You take it apart. You see things you recognize, and you, you, you try to reproduce those. You may struggle. You may be missing some pieces of the technology that allow you to create those pieces, but you can see them and recognize them. What's going on in the brain that makes that more of a challenge? Why is it I can't just take a brain from a person who's, who's passed away or – an MRI, see what's going on, just say, okay, we'll just get the computer to do that. Well, that's a scale issue. I mean, now we are talking about practicalities. You know, MRI, it's a, it's a marvelous technique, but it, you know, its resolution is millimeters usually in clinical circumstances, you know, maybe uh, um, tens of microns in the most extreme uh, uh, research environments. You know, it's still orders of magnitude bigger than this scale of molecules so that but if we had know, if we had a better mri whatever that means w would understanding the, the molecular level of activity in the brain in th in theory give us or in practice give us a brain uh well n now yes that now we're going on from the, the the practicalities, you know, if we had a better MRI, you know, it's in the category of, you know, uh, if my grandmother you know, could, could, could fly, she'd be an airplane. Yeah, maybe. Um, exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that there, there are, interesting technical reasons why it's difficult to make the resolution of, uh, of MRI a great deal smaller than it currently is. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, 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 that this is all uh, very uh, technical issues. I mean, I think, you know, the high, it is possible to get quite high resolution uh, read, readouts, if you like, of brains. And, there's, you know, fascinating work, this idea of looking for the connectome, you know, people are, uh, are, are, are trying to work out the connections of all the neurons in, 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 in animal brains. Fascinating, fascinating science. Downside of that is that it generally requires the, the, the creature, A, to be dead in the first place because the techniques are necessarily destructive. Uh, and then, as I say, there's still the question. The connectivity probably still isn't enough. It's the state of, you know, it's the state of the molecules that are sitting in the synapses that are uh, controlling the strength of interaction across synapses. So it, uh, I, I'm really just emphasizing I'm not... You know, in a sense, the thought experiment's an interesting one, but that's not the relevant question for what's going to happen in the next hundred years. 
Let's see, I'm just going to read a quote here that relates to this from the book. You say the following. One metaphor that is important is the idea that the brain has a wiring diagram. The human brain has about 100 billion neurons, each of which is connected to many others by thin fibers, the axons and dendrites, along which electrical signals pass. There's about 100,000 miles of axon in a brain connecting at between 100 to 1,000 trillion synaptic connections. It's this pattern of connectivity between the neurons through the axons and dendrites that constitutes the wiring diagram of the brain. I'll argue that below that knowing this wiring diagram is not yet a sufficient condition for simulating the operation of a brain. It must surely, however, be a necessary one. So, end of quote. So that conveys some of the magnitude of the the physical challenge. But again, give enough time, um, perhaps we could get at that. I guess, I mean, there is something really f fascinating about the idea that that if I could observe your brain in real time, which of course is not possible, remotely possible now, and I knew the initial conditions, I could predict the, your actions and thoughts for the next, for the rest of your life. And there, raise, raise, thereby raising this question, a classic question, essentially it'd be God. I'd be raising the question of, of free will. If I know what you're going to do, how much free will could you possibly have? Um, you sidestep that correctly, I think, for a book of this length. It's only about 45, 46 pages for those listening at home. It's very nice. Um, but you are suggesting there's something more than just uh, a physical challenge here. Is that correct or not? Well, I think, you know, yes, the question of free will, again, that's fascinating and that could take us a long time. And the, the, again, and I, you know, I, 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 many people who are much cleverer than me have thought about that in great detail. The only point I would make is just the physical one that actually, in principle, we wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, even if we thought that everything about the brain was re reducible to where the, you know, where the molecules were, um, we would not be able to reproduce that into the future from knowing in, in the initial conditions because uh, there's a fundamental randomness about the way that uh, biological macromolecules work. That's that's a funda next, yeah, that's my segue. Carry on. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, and it's fascinating to ask where that randomness comes from. I think it's actually pretty fundamental. But, uh, you know, there is no doubt if I was trying to, you know, if I'm setting up a computer simulation to simulate, uh, you know, at the molecular level, what, uh, you know, what's happening when a receptor molecule um, when a, a, a messenger molecule hits a receptor molecule, uh, the way I do that simulation would have randomness built in because that's the nature of the physics. I mean, to be technical, I'd be solving Langevin equations, which have a, you know a random term in it, a, a noise term, which really arises from the Brownian motion, from the bombardment of the molecule by the surrounding water molecules. So that kind of randomness, it's a fundamental feature of the warm, wet nanoscale world, which is what our brains work in. But you did you do make the point at one place in the book that is that and this is a philosophical question as much as it is a scientific one is that randomness that we observe in the in that wet world uh, and in the world of, of physics generally is that something fundamental or is that just a statement that we don't yet really fully understand the physics what are your thoughts on that well, I think it's it's fundamental at the level that it comes from quantum mechanics. That much I am sure of. Of course, the, uh, where the randomness in quantum mechanics comes from is something that I'm not sure of because that's hotly debated. But, uh, you, you know, to the extent that we can tie it down to a particular bit of physics that produces randomness, it's, it's the quantum mechanics that does it. Now, you don't talk about this in the book, but it's something I keep thinking about and reading about, uh, which is consciousness. Uh, philosophers have recently been arguing, um, Nagel and Chalmers most uh, prominently, that our current understanding of the physical world does not uh, allow us to account for the existence of consciousness, the, the feeling that, that our life is, is, is like a movie in some sense, the feeling that Certain things are exhilarating, the feeling that we have memories that bother us or that excite us or thoughts of the future, that all of these, this complex um, inner world that we have is somehow not amenable to the uh, standard uh, science of biology. Have you thought about that at all? Do you know anything about that literature? Does it speak to you? 
I, I've thought about it, and you, you know, I, I wouldn't want to. Uh, I, I'd want to be very tentative in my, my response. I mean, I'm, and you know, and I refer to my own kind of my own intellectual tradition, as it were, as a, as a physicist. You know, the kind of physics I do. The, the idea of emergent phenomena is very important and I think very subtle and very deep. And, you know, I, I don't know whether this is going to give the answer. I am enormously comfortable about the idea that, that consciousness can be something that emerges from uh, the, uh, the microscopic description of, you know, the microscopic physical description of what's going out on without... Uh, 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 while still not in some sense being fully explained by that uh, physical substrate, if you see what I mean. But uh, that, that, that's a long discussion. Yeah. Um, you write the following. You say, if you are alive now, and by that now I think you mean when you've issued this book, you say, if you are alive now, your mind will not be uploaded. What comforts does this leave for those fearing oblivion and the void, but reluctant to engage with the traditional consolations of religion and philosophy? Transhumanists have two cards left to play. What are those cards, and um, what do you think of them? Uh, I think, well, I mean, one, one of the cards those, is cryonic. Yeah, those cards are cryonic. Sorry? Those cards are cryonics and radical life extensions. Since I finished your book about forty minutes before the interview started, I'm probably more up on it than you are. So I just didn't yeah. want to didn't want to surprise you there. Yeah, well, cryonics. I think you know, cryonics is this idea that one would be able to, uh, to 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 freeze oneself, and then at some some later stage, one has to uh, uh, hope that some advanced civilization would find it worthwhile to uh, revive you and uh, and um, uh, and uh, uh, repair any damage that's been done. Um, you know, I don't know. It's not something that appeals to me. I think. You know, everything I've said about the state of, you know, the mind, the, con the connectome not being sufficient, if you like, to reproduce a mind, the, the, the need to, to understand what the molecules, where the molecules are and what state they're in, makes it quite difficult for me to think that the process of freezing a brain, which is a physically very intrusive process, uh, I find it very difficult to believe that the kind of randomness that that would uh, impose on it wouldn't scramble up whatever consciousness that one might have. Uh, and I guess I also, you know, it, it, it depends on this idea that, uh, that, that well, two things are going to happen. One is that in the future we will have technologies that are much more advanced and able to, uh, to, to un unscramble that scrambling. And B, the idea that people would want to do it. I don't know. Neither of those things seems enormously convincing to me. But want to do it, I mean, in the future, that they'd want to unfreeze yeah. you and bring you back to life as a kindness or a you know, great, yeah. great, great, great grandfather Richard always wanted to see 2200. So we'll just um, we'll put him in the microwave, you know. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. It might be cheap. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. yeah so, well, we'll see. It, it'd be the best way to do history. You know, we'd find out what. 2016 was really like um, – I'm kidding. Okay, so um, let's turn to technology. Yeah, radical life extension. What? Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean I think there – I mean this is actually a point that I think um, – you know, who can say they don't want to see – all the difficult diseases of old age being cured. Of course, everybody does. I mean, I certainly do. You know, it's uh, um, that, that there's a huge amount of suffering in the world that comes from people who get diseases of old age. And, you, you know, we very much ought to be spending a great deal of effort trying to work out how to ameliorate that suffering. But I cannot believe that the, 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 the problems are actually that close to being solved and this is you know this is like i guess a, a case in point where i think looking at moore's law generalizing that to the idea that you know we're in the state of uh, you know exponentially accelerating technology therefore every problem that could conceivably have a technological solution will get such a technological solution in the near future i think that's a delusion and 
you know, in a sense, you only have to look at medical science to realise why that's so. And there's this fantastic observation, which I, uh, this idea of a room's law. You know, you look at drug development, uh, the cost of developing new drugs is actually increasing exponentially. It's not getting exponentially easier. It's getting exponentially more difficult to produce more drugs. And uh, if we look at diseases like, uh, you know, particularly Alzheimer's, because I think, you, you know, the, the various types of dementia that we all get more susceptible to as we get into old age, you know, we don't even really know what's causing most of those. We, you know, we haven't really got to the point where, we, where we've identified the, the, the causal agent, let alone find out, you know, what the therapy is that's going to solve them. So, you know, it would be fantastic if we could work out how to cure those diseases. We probably ought to be spending more effort trying to work out how to do it than we, we currently do. But I think to say that radical life extension is, you know, round the corner and current 60 and 70 year olds are going to be able to, to, to benefit from that, I think is just kind of a bit of a hollow joke, a bit of a delusion. Well, you could argue we're spending too much on them. And I think in America... We've subsidized certain types of gadgets um, and devices and treatments, uh, maybe outside of the United States, not so much, gone the other direction. But it's not obvious to me that we're spending the right amount on extending life versus improving the quality of life when we're well, younger. Well, I suppose and, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I mean, I think, yes, I mean, I think it goes without saying to say that one, you, you, one talks about extending life. It should be, you know, healthy life. Yeah, that, it's not uh, the only thing that counts. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Although, you know, we'll live to 250, and it's true, the last 170 years of that, we'll be playing tennis in our virtual reality world, in our uploaded, you know, laying in our hospital bed. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I, you know, I am sort of a – it's it's funny. This book's a very sobering look at, at optimism. I'm something of a technical – a techno-optimist. Uh, I do think that technology has made lots of things better, and I do think that – Life is improved. You do too, as well on that. Certainly on that yeah, last point, you, you, you talk about that in the book. But let's let's turn to technology generally. Um, uh, you say that it's dangerous to see technological progress as inevitable, and that that might be a conservative philosophy rather than something you might call a liberating or or life affirming one. Uh, why is that? Well, I think it, I mean it's dangerous in, in in two senses. One is because I think it, you know it isn't inevitable, and I think if you stop trying, it will stop happening. And actually, you know, we could have a much longer conversation about uh, you know the debate that's going on now about you know innovation stagnation, the kind of uh, you know Gordon argument that the golden age of American growth is over. I actually think there's something in that. I think, you know, we look across the developed world, productivity has been steadily falling since the, the, the 70s. So, uh, you know, if we connect uh, economic growth and particularly, you know, per capita GDP and uh, labor productivity, if we if we connect those to technological innovation in some general sense, so I think the numbers tell us that technological innovation is indeed slowing down, uh, you know, with some suitable average that, uh, that 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 translates into those broad aggregates. So uh, I think it's not inevitable that technological progress happens. I think you know we have to have the structures in society that will make it happen and there's a big question i think about whether we have got those right structures in place now so that's part of my argument if we think that technological progress is inevitable we won't try hard enough to make sure it does happen and we'll end up stagnating for that reason and the other th the, the other point i think is about the direction of technology i mean you you already talked about whether you think in the United States you make the right choices about uh, medical technology, you know, the choice of what technology you work on, what technology you don't work on, these are choices. They're made either implicitly or explicitly by somebody or, you know, as an implicit consequence of the way that you've set up your economic system. If you think that technology is just this single thing that steams ahead without intervention, you will be leaving those choices 
for somebody else or something else to make. So I think one needs to be deliberate about the technological choices that you make. And that, I think, uh, is something that transhumanism gets in the way of because it makes you think that it's all uh, inevitable and there's no point uh, interfering with it, if you like. And as I say, that's potentially a, a, a kind of conservative position because, you know, broadly speaking, I think... Uh, you know, there's some political economy of innovation, and I think uh, that that will favour, you know, the innovations that will happen will be the innovations that favour those that have incumbent power in whatever political economy you've got. Yeah, I'm going to come to that in a second. I just want to put a footnote on your um, discussion about stagnation. I think the there is some suggestion that productivity is down, that uh, measure productivity is down, certainly. And then the question is whether we're measuring output correctly, Um you know, the, right now, I'd say that our measurement systems for things like GDP, for things like productivity, they were always very imperfect. I think they've gotten more imperfect. I don't know if that's a legitimate phrase, but it probably isn't. It's just imperfect, but we've gotten less accurate uh, as the world has become more digital and as we inhabit the virtual world in the way we, we do more and more often. Um, just to take an obvious example, this conversation has no, uh, well, a little bit of contribution to GDP because I'm paid by Liberty Fund to produce it. Um, but there is no payment by the listeners. They enjoy it at no charge and they seem to enjoy it. Uh, they listen and they they value it despite the fact they don't pay for it. So it's hard to measure, I think, productivity in this world. We haven't figured that out. We also haven't figured out the institutional ways to deal with this type of innovation you know, driverless cars, some very interesting things happening there, but certainly the institutional framework, the political economy for coping with driverless cars or even dr driven cars like Uber, uh, we're using very old, ancient 1950s style regulation to, to cope with it. And we're going to have to create some new stuff to make that stuff, the new stuff uh, as productive as it could be. So I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if that happens. But I want to come to your last point about... Yeah, can I just... Yeah. I, I do want to reply to that yeah, because I, I, mean, I, I, I think that's an argument. It's a really interesting argument. We spent a lot of time talking about that. I don't fully buy the argument about mismeasurement of GDP. I mean, I, buy the, I, mean, I do buy the argument that GDP is mismeasured. Uh, but I think, you know, again, I agree with Gordon on this. I think it was ever thus. And I think... You know, if we look, go back to the early 20th century, you know, the example I, that struck me because I looked the numbers up, you know, in the UK, right up to about 1930, the change was very quick. The death rates for giving for childbirth were about 5%. So, you know, every child you produced, you had a 5% chance of dying. Okay, so that's not in the GDP either. But, you know, the chance of that that you or your loved one is going to every time you try and produce an infant you've got a five percent chance of dying i mean that's a huge unmeasured contribution to gdp so i accept that you know listening to an interesting podcast is a, a kind of in, a, a, a piece of uh, of value that we're not capturing in gdp but you know we have to argue what's more important in here that there were some very big ones in in the past too well, but that's an interesting example because as we've lowered that mortality rate, uh, those improvements, you know, you can you can debate whether the word in, what the word in means, but those improvements are not in GDP. And in fact, some of the some situations, they would lower GDP by creating more people who live longer and who are retired, say, or not in, with certainly lower per capita income, which is one of the reasons per capita income is a, has to be used carefully. Um, so... It, it, it's a complicated point, uh, but I take your point that um, it's e it's easy to say uh, GDP is measured imperfectly. That that's not enough by itself to uh, to refute, say, Gordon's or others' arguments about stagnation. What I think is important is that you and I spend an immense amount of time. I suspect even you, with all your the work you do as a academic in your institution and as a researcher and as a scientist, uh, you probably spend a reasonable some amount of time doing stuff that is just entertainment, inspiring, um, heartwarming that comes through, say, the Internet, which just didn't exist 50 years ago, 30 years ago. And you could argue, well, there were other things that existed then. There was a 
you could have a wonderful dinner with your family and that w- wasn't correctly measured in GDP by the cost of the food or the electricity you used to cook it or any of that. So I take that point, but it is interesting that a lot of the stuff that gives people lots of satisfaction in today's world is not measured. Now, you could argue also it's a negative. People are obsessed with these things. They should go, you know, the sign's wrong. So it is a mess, but uh, I'd say we don't, there's a change there. You could argue certainly GDP in the past wasn't measured accurately, uh, but there was a baseline that you were changing from here. It seems more of a qualitative than a mere quantitative change. Of course, you're right. And, you know, I never realized that videos of cats could be so funny. So exactly. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thereby totally destroying my argument, uh, perhaps. But anyway, let's, I, w- I want to move on to, a, to a, a very provocative thing you say toward the end of your book, which is the following. Um, one could argue that – this is a quote – one could argue that transhumanism's singular, singularitarianism – constitutes the state religion of Californian techno-neoliberalism. And like all state religions, its purpose is to justify the power of the incumbents. Uh, what are you talking about there? Really interesting well, idea. Yeah, I, I mean, it is really interesting uh, you know, uh, about uh, you know who are the people who are interested in transhumanist ideas. And it is conspicuous that it's the – you know the – the people who are um, the, uh, the, the the kind of uh, the, the great and good of the, the Californian tech scene. So you know, it's Ray Kurzweil is employed by Google. Uh, you, you've got people like Peter Thiel who, who, who you know made their fortunes in in the tech world and have turned into evangelists for these ideas. So it seems to me, uh, you know, significant that the, the, that. This is a set of ideas that, you know, frankly, if I go around Sheffield and Rotherham, you know, I don't suppose there's a transhumanist in the entire place. But uh, 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 in, it's a backwater. It's so what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I know. You know, people around me, they talk about beef cows. It's not... Um, but yes, uh, so, so, so I think that kind of... The, yeah, that association of, uh, uh, you know, where these ideas are seem to be widely held and influential, it seems significant. And I think the idea, and this comes back to this idea about technolog- technology being inevitable. If you're in a position to benefit from the advance of technology in a particular direction, then it very much suits your book to say that uh, you know, there's no point worrying about it. This is going to happen, and that's how it's going to be. So, in that sense, it is something that uh, it, it, that they are a set of ideas that do justify uh, that that particular set of incumbents. And to bring it back to bear on my own personal philosophy, I think in my political and economic philosophy, uh, I am a classical liberal, called sometimes a neoliberal um, by others who are not as as fond of it as I am. And, you know, basically my worldview says the the role of the state is to do a handful of things that it does well, courts, property, uh, defense, police, and not much beyond that. And I allow for emergent, bottom-up ways, voluntary cooperation among people to solve social problems as well as to regulate industry through competition. And that's an argument for, quote, leaving things alone. Now, one of the critiques you could make of that worldview is, that, well, it's easy for me to say I have a good life. Uh, of course, I want to leave things alone, and my children are going to have probably a good life, and so they're going to benefit from leaving things alone more or less. So this idea that – I'm trying to give your argument a little more bite. Uh, it's an argument I think you adapted uh, from, from another writer. Oh, Dale Carrico, yes. Carrico, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So that criticism is, well, you know, The rich and the powerful benefit from technology, not so much the poor. Now, the counterpoint to that, of course, is that poor people seems to me have much better lives than they had 100 years ago. And that technology plays a pretty large role in that. And I guess the counterpoint to that is they could have even better lives if maybe if it was steered in a certain way. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think there's two two, two parts to that. One is, I mean, I, uh, to the to, to, to the classical liberal, I would assert that actually. Um, that that worldview seriously underestimates the role of the government in shaping the technology that we've got now. 
So uh, I think, uh, you know, it's no coincidence the giant burst of technological progress that we've seen, that we're seeing now, followed, you know, a world war and then a cold war that was basically fought with technology. And, you, you know, you go back to this, you know, the classical argument about the iPhone, you know, all those technologies um, came ultimately from uh, from government uh, government as a commissioner as a uh, as a, a a driver of technology i'm not saying I, I do need to stress i don't mean by that that, that, that the private the private sector wasn't enormously important in making those technologies you know integrating those technologies making them into actual products but you know the the fun thing that your iphone does because it's got an accelerate acceler- and sorry an accelerometer in those accelerometers, you know, why did anybody make accelerometers? It's because they needed to make uh, guidance systems for, for ballistic missiles. So, you know, there's thousands of those examples that you can think of where you can trace back the uh, the, the technologies that are now in consumer products through to uh, through to those government interventions. So. I, I, as I say, I, I, I just, you know, I agree with you that technology has benefited uh, many people, rich and poor. I disagree with you that those technologies, you know, uh, best emerge from the government not intervening. I'm not necessarily saying that the, that the ways that those technologies emerged through, you know, as part of this military industrial complex was the ideal way of doing it. So I think uh, that... The, I think it's quite difficult, I think, to be a classical liberal and to be um, uh, and to, uh, uh, to to be in a world where you think that radical advances in technology are a good thing. Well, I think it'd be a lot better. I mean, I, I remember when people used to um, point to Bell Labs, which is government funded for a long time and a source of a lot of innovation and you know, it's not obvious to me that having a much better telephone, say, or whatever was Bell Labs was creating at the time, was worth it. I, you know, it's not the, the real problem oh, with. Well, well, I got a minute. Bell Labs invented the transistor. You wouldn't have had any. You know, you wouldn't have a computer. You wouldn't have a, 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 a cell phone. Correct. Bell, the Bell Labs was... invented. Bell Labs invented Unix. I mean, so uh, you know, I, I was interesting. It wasn't so much that it was directly government funded. Actually, that was an interesting case because, in a sense, Bell Labs was propped up on the yeah, monopoly. It's complicated. Rent. Yeah, it's a little more complicated. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but, 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 the product of a government. I, I, I correct. But uh, yes, I, I mean that's a it's a long argument that we could have, uh, but but I think you know the history, looking at the history of innovation, it, it, it is interesting. I, I think that, you know the radical in, innovations, the second half of the twentieth century, they didn't emerge from from from, from a bottom up process, uh, you know, for better or worse. That's just the way it was. Well, I think a lot of it did. I think, but I, I'm just trying to make a subtler point, which is that. Just because technology emerges doesn't mean it was worth the investment, right? People improve well, so-called too. improvements yeah. um, that are made are not necessarily worth it. It depends on the costs, and the private sector spends a lot of time worrying about whether the, it's worth it. Uh, but they, of course, don't take into account all the costs, and they don't take account all the benefits. The, pro- the public sector, in theory, takes care, care of both, but I think in practice doesn't do such a good job of that either, but for different reasons. Um, of course, it's an unanswerable question what would happen if the government got out of the technology business. It is certainly in today's world, for whatever you can argue about what's happened in the past, it's certainly true in today's world that there's a lot of effort being spent at private efforts to improve technology. Now, that still has been incentivized in many cases, as I mentioned with medical devices. It's been incentivized by public policies that make some things more profitable than others. So it's inherently an unanswerable question. Uh, But my only point that I think I'll let you disagree if you want. My only point is that, yes, it's true that there were there were technologies in the iPhone and and elsewhere that came came from government. But basically, no one is steering technology now. And I want to make sure I get your point right about about taking care of elites and, and the powerful, I don't think it's steered very much by public policy. It certainly could be, though, to 
achieve certain ends or try to achieve certain ends. And my general feeling is, is that it wouldn't serve the public. It would serve those elites anyway. That's why I tend to want government to be less involved rather than more. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's arguable. I mean, I think, you know, the mechanisms, I, I say steer. And in many cases, you know, perhaps that's, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking that this is, you know, steer occurs, you know, in the sense that there's some committee that sits around and says, you know, we're going to put £10 billion into a moonshot to make this, that or the other. It's, you know, the the, the, the way in which public policy plays out, the incentives that, 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 that are constructed that favour one kind of innovation rather than the other. You know, and healthcare actually is a fantastic example because, you know, you've got kind of two contrasting systems either side of the Atlantic. You know, you have your heavily private sector based healthcare system that nonetheless produces all sorts of incentives, some positive, some not positive. This side of the Atlantic we have, you know, a, a, actually a very top down centralized system that actually in its own way is not brilliant for innovation either. But you know, it, it, it steers innovation in in different directions. And again, you know, not with anybody really thinking about it. It's just the, the you know often unintended consequences of policy decisions that are made for other reasons. Yeah, we don't have a very private system. It's just more private than yours, but I, you know, I'll, I'll concede that. But um, we have steadily for the last 60 years moved away from a private system in the most important uh, variable, which is who pays for it. And um, what's yeah. what's true in the American system is it's there's still a lot of private providers, but they are increasingly constrained by public policy of various of various kinds. Um, yeah, and the, I mean, the other thing to say is, of course, you, you know, th th this is unpredictable. I think, uh, you know, the difference I think that that that, ha that happens here, I think, you know, the the private sector and particularly, you know, users. There's a huge amount of innovation that happens, you know, through the you know the interaction of users with technologies. People use technologies in different ways, and that's noticed by, yeah. uh, you know, actors who are able then to to exploit that. You know, that's a fantastic way of kind of doing local optimization, if you like. Yep. But it seems to me that the major interventions that cause big saltations, if you like, big leaps in innovation, they need a bigger push than that. They don't often, you know, they often don't go in the directions that people who are making that push intended. Uh, you know, the, the most the, 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 the most far reaching example that I always talk about when we talk about this is the Harbour Bosch process. The Harbour Bosch process has absolutely transformed the 20th century, the process for fixing nitrogen. It probably means that the population of the world's, you know, twice, you know, more than twice as big as it otherwise would be. You know, more than half of the population of the world as it currently stands exist because of this piece of technology. That piece of technology was developed in the First World War by the, the, the German government at the time, and it was developed to create explosives because Germany didn't have access to, to, to the nitrates from, from Chile due to the, the, the blockades of their country during the First World War. So, you know, it was a massive effort. Yeah. It was a massive effort. You look into how much, you know, the, the amount of money the German government spent on commercializing that process under the pressure of being in this war, it was colossal. It was unthinkable that a private sector actor could have done that. And it had absolutely far-reaching consequences, which were not, in fact, the consequences that caused the innovation to be to, to be developed in the first place. Yeah, that's a fantastic example. The only other thing I would add to that is the, uh, which we haven't mentioned, is the role of um, the patent system, intellectual property, which uh, I worry is increasingly used to protect incumbents. Um, uh, it's a complicated issue, obviously. It's not easily... It's hard to know what the right answer is, uh, but I do worry about the political influence there. And um, so I just want to accept your point that we shouldn't be um, cheering all technology no matter what, because there's a good chance that some of it is being influenced by folks who benefit from it. And I think we should always be aware of that. No, and I'm, I'm with you on the patent issue. I mean, I think you know that that that, that was it, it, it's a good idea that, uh, that 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 actually again you know actually patents it's a social innovation, isn't it? And even the you know, social innovations can be used and misused too. Let's close with uh, artificial intelligence more generally. Um, so you're a pessimist about 
uh, the uh, rapture of the nerds, but we don't have to go all the way to the rapture to get to a very radically changed world. And a lot of very smart people um, in the last year, uh, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and others have said that the rise of artificial intelligence were, is around the corner to being a threat to humanity. Uh, do you want to say anything about that? Well, I, yes. I mean, it, it clearly is a threat to humanity. Well, it's it's a powerful technology, and it clearly is advancing very fast. And uh, it's um, you know the concatenation of the availability of huge amounts of data and you know techniques for for, for assimilating or you know generalizing from that data, if you like, kind of you know machine learning ideas. These are very powerful ideas that will have uh, significant significant applications. Uh, we have autonomous systems that already, you know, already are um, being used in ways that, you know, some people at least would uh, uh, think, th think was a threat. I'm thinking about, you know, increasingly autonomous drones. Um, you know, the day that uh, um, a terrorist organization works out how to take a self-driving car and make a car bomb out of it is not going to be a very cheerful prospect. So, I, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, st stepping one back from s saying this is an existential threat to humanity, but it's these are powerful technologies, undoubtedly, that will have far-reaching influences, not necessarily for the good. My guest today has been Richard Jones. Richard, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>